you'll never guess where I am. This is the yarn barn of my friend Janet from Timber Creek Farms. And she built this specially on her property so she could dye her yarn here, give classes here, have fellowship and fun with other people of like minds. And I was invited here today to share some time with her, do some crafts, and see what she's been up to. She's got some spinning wheels that she's learning how to use. Her main thing is she dyes yarn from her own sheep. And she uses a lot of natural materials from her own property to make some dyes, among other things. I'm going to show you some of the yarn that she's done. This yarn here was just recently dyed. It's beautiful. She'll be selling this at the Homesteaders of America conference this October in Virginia. Isn't this the coolest place? Beautiful yarn. And here's my friend Janet sitting in her yarn barn and we're going to sit and crochet and chat together. I'm going to show you the yarn that I've gotten from Janet. All right, this is beautiful. Speckled yarn. Is that considered tweed, Janet? Um, yeah, they call it a tweed. It's a tweed yarn. This is from her own sheep and she has dyed it. Isn't it beautiful? Now this is two weights of yarn. There's uh, Aaron and DK. Yes. One's a little bit thinner than the other. And she has wound these. They started out like this in twists and she has wound those skeins for me so I can pull from the center and use them for making projects. And here Janet is showing us just how she winds up that yarn for me. She's so kind to do it. It's going to save me a whole lot of time. What did you say this thing was called? This is called a yarn swift. A and yarn swift. Right here we have a ball winder. And working together, it takes about a minute to um, wind a skein of yarn into a ball. And so it saves a lot of time if you do this over, you know, sitting there trying to wind the, the, the balls up. And then when you get down to the end, it does kind of catch a little, but you just watch what you're doing. And and there's my ball yarn over there. It's so much easier to crochet and knit from. So we're just going to chat here like you're not even watching. Yeah, this we've is, been chatting away. <laughs> we've been here already a few what, a a hours. A couple hours, yeah, <laughs> having a good old time. And, and we were like, you. oh, we didn't do any video. <laughs> <laughs> Got to turn the camera on at some point. I'm going to show you something I made the last couple of days. Okay. It's a Christmas tree hat, something silly for the season that will be coming up before we know it. And I'm going to decorate it and put yarn balls on it and a star on top and yeah, it's going to be cute. I love it. <laughs> and it's done with that crocodile stitch or dragon scale, yeah. whatever you want to call it. I think that's one of the most unique things I've seen with that stitch. <laughs> I love it. Marigolds are going to give you a beautiful yellow color. Um, you can dry them and they'll last forever. Uh, you just put them in back in water to rehydrate them and the color will start to come out. Um, zinnias and um, a lot of your florals are going to give you a version of yellow. Um, but you can easily adapt that yellow into greens and blues and reds by mixing other um, plant dyes into them. So yellow is a great starting spot. Uh, last year I got a really beautiful peachy colored um, dye from my zinnia, so we'll see what happens this year. Um, I have so many marigolds. Marigolds just did great in my gardens this year, so I was really happy about that. Um, and they look so vibrant, so I'm going to be doing those soon. Coreopsis is a powerhouse. These little tiny yellow flowers, um, they're so gentle and delicate when they're growing, but they have... An amazing amount of color even in the stems and leaves. And over here Susie I have um, my dried flowers and dried 
dye stuffs. Um, this is a dried. This is dried coreopsis that I bought, as opposed to the bowl I just showed you on uh -huh. the other side. Um, this is weld. Weld is a garden plant that's fairly easy to grow and also makes a beautiful clear yellow. This actually is the yellow that most people refer to when they want to do a secondary color, like a yellow with blue to make green. Uh -huh. This is what they'll use like to mix uh, or over dye with indigo uh -huh. and make a really pretty green. So here's that. I have. When my jar of onion skins gets too full, I dump them in here. Onion skins also makes a yellow, so that is a row of yellow dye. You could also buy uh, extract dyes in dried form. Here's a, my drawer of um, dried marigolds from mm -hmm. other years. Like they will definitely keep. That, oh, this is hibiscus. Hibiscus petals, um, you can find them easily at the store. For, I've got a nice big hibiscus yeah, plant. Yep, you can have it. It's an easy plant to grow, but you can also just buy the, the hibiscus tea, which is just uh, hibiscus petals. Mm -hmm. That's an easy one to attain almost anywhere. Um, they looked awful small. My hibiscus are Yeah, these are big. these are dried and ground. Yes. And, uh, okay, so it's yeah. ground up. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then this is matter root. This is where you get your oranges and reds. Actually, you can even get purple from this by mm. modifying it uh, in a high enough concentration and then adding a more alkaline. Now, is this something you purchased? Um, this is. I have tried to grow matter root, but you have to grow it successfully for three years in order to harvest the roots. Mm. So the roots don't have color in them uh, or substantial color in them until they're mature. Okay. So that's great. This is black beans. <laughs> and they make a beautiful light blue color. Uh, you can also go to grays and light greens with it. Mm -hmm. And the thing about that I like about it is these are dried beans, so they last forever. And you can still use the beans. You're going to soak your beans anyway before you yep. cook them. So you soak them, it's the water that you're going to pour off that is your dye. So the beans are still... So you're yeah, not, I've, I've seen the water pour yeah. off different colors. Yeah, you're not <laughs> wasting your... Um, See if there's anything else in here. I do <laughs> That's have. a nice little apothecary yeah, cabinet. Isn't that, you have isn't that here. cool? So this is where I yeah. store. And then sometimes I use these um, these liquid dye extracts. These are natural dyes, but in liquid form in a highly concentrated uh, format. Mm -hmm. And these are great for modifying. I love to use them both as the full color, but also if I just want to add a little touch of another color to mm -hmm. kind of shift um, what I've done. So these come in a lot of the same things. This is a indigo. It's called Saxon Blue Indigo. This is Matter. That's the same, the same, root, same yeah. as this. And this is pomegranate. Well, now tell me what you used on these particular colors okay, right here. Sure. Okay, so this is Logwood. Okay. This, this purple is just a lighter That's one. That's pretty. Mm -hmm. um, this one's not marked. It's probably one of the weeds that grow here on our property, this green. I love it that you <laughs> color with things I know. on your property. I love that too. This is Goldenrod, one yep. of my favorites. Mm -hmm. And this is another form of green here. Mm -hmm. uh, this is um, a lighter cochineal, which is a red, but this is a... Um, I love that color. Yeah, this is a less concentrated form mm -hmm. of it. And then over here, I have quite a few of these. Um, you got them marked. I do have them marked because, you know, can't, yep. can't hold everything in my memory, right? This is a lighter orange matter root. Some of these are combinations, like this one is marigold and Saxon blue. This is logwood. Oh, yeah. That's great. You can see all these beautiful purples that mm -hmm. you can get with that logwood. This is an over dye on a gray yarn, mm -hmm. and it is from Saxon blue and... Um, Citric acid. Now you probably just told me when you talk about logwood, mm -hmm. but it, I didn't retain it. Mm -hmm. How it? Now you, you purchased that, but what mm -hmm. do they take it? It's a bark of a yeah, tree. Yeah, it's both in a. Um, and where does it grow? Do you know? They're in like South America and Brazil. Oh, is where that's okay. a so native the purples tree. purples are from there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and then um, here's a different different um, 
result of matter, a little, little browner. Yeah. And then some of your more naturals, this is Kutch, which is one of those liquids I just showed you. Mm -hmm. Using, um, you know, you can add a little bit of iron or a little bit of washing soda, vinegar, oh. something like that to shift your pH and it'll shift your color. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. There you go. All right. Once you have your yarn, um, either, either you bought um, undyed yarn or you want to um, use your own yarn like I'm doing from my sheep, um, you're going to have to mordant it, which is uh, preparing the yarn to accept the dye. And this is a step you can't skip when you're using wool. Um, it's not the same as using an acid dye, which is a uh, chemical created color with vinegar. This is a natural dye from plant sources, so you have to make it so that the yarn will talk to the dye. And the way you do that is to soak it in a solution called the mordant. Um, for some dyes, you're going to want to use a vinegar bath to soak it, and especially for pokeberry, which I've been working on right now because it's pokeberry season. So this has been soaking in a very um, heavily concentrated vinegar and water solution mm -hmm. here. So. so that makes it more porous? It opens up the cells of the wool so that it will grab the dye. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, though, for most colors, we use alum. So these have already been done. It looks like spaghetti. It does look like spaghetti, <laughs> and, and my husband has often come home and said, what's for dinner? But now that I'm dying down here at the farm, he doesn't have that opportunity anymore. <laughs> so let me um, show you what I've done here with the vinegar, the vinegar solution, Woo! and the poke berries. And I always say to myself after I put my hands in there, I should have put some gloves on. Now, well, um, well they, they look purple. Are they going to stay like that? Or when they get washed, is, will they be This is pretty thicker? much what it's going to stay. I love it. It's so, like a, look, look at Yeah. My shirt. Oh, yeah, it is your shirt. <laughs> it will. Magenta. Um, it will change a little bit because it won't be wet. But it's pretty yeah. much, it stays pretty much this way. I love that. And this is my <laughs> new method for working with pokeberry. Um, I let the yarn sit in the vinegar water for a couple days in addition mm -hmm. to heating it briefly and I don't use any heat at all on the dye. Mm -hmm. um, the pokeberry is very sensitive to heat and can easily turn brown mm -hmm. instead of red and so I decided to just start using it as a cold dye and it takes longer. I let them sit in the dye for another three or four days. Now do you crush the berries up? Mm -hmm. or? I yeah. crush the berries up mm -hmm. then I strain them out after mm -hmm. a few days of uh, sitting in the dye bath and then put the yarn in and let that sit for a few days and then I won't rinse this until it dries. Mm -hmm. I will just hang this somewhere where the, the pink won't stain anything Yep. and I'll just hang it and let it I dry. Love it. And then I'm going to get the other side with the lights behind. Also does a little bit of <laughs> curing go. of the color mm -hmm. if you just let it dry on there and then when I rinse it it really won't um, there will be excess color that comes out, but the yarn has been staying pretty much cool. what you see here. Love it. I know. Isn't it amazing? Yeah. Um, I hate pokeberry growing in my yard, but yeah, look what you can do with it. I know. It's like black walnuts. Nobody yes. likes them all over their yes. yard, but they are amazing when you're trying to dye wool. <laughs> so the other thing is, if I wanted to, and I had time to just stand here and babysit this yarn, I could take this pot, put it on the burner, and actually get this to turn red. Oh, wow. Instead of this magenta, mm -hmm. fuchsia color. And I see that my berries are attracting yellow jackets they today, are. I see the which bees does not there. make me super happy. But <laughs> <laughs> it's going to get cold tonight, so maybe they'll all go away. Um, so anyway. Take a look at the uh, source of your yarn here. Yeah. <laughs> there they are, <laughs> having their little sleepy time in the, in the, in the yard. Oh, my goodness. And how often do your sheep get sheared? We shear once a year in the spring, usually uh, late March or beginning of April. Um, some breeds can get sheared twice a year, but ours are not a long wool. They're a medium length wool, so we just do once a year. Turn the water off so you can hear me over it. We're going to try a little uh, dye uh, process using some of these um, liquid concentrates of natural dyes and we're going to use Saxon blue and pomegranate and see if we can get to a bluish gray color. Mm -hmm. Getting my scale ready because I want to have an idea of 
how much I'm using. So I'm going to uh, tear that down to zero. And then I'm going to start with eight grams. I don't know why I choose eight. Eight is always like something that I choose as like a starting point. Um, I guess it's worked in the past. I didn't so. read that anywhere. It's just mm -hmm. like, I'm just going to make a small batch so I don't want to go overboard. Whoops, that's 10. Well, it's 10. So it is. <laughs> and then we're going to add some pomegranate, which will often bring up the gray colors. Um, it can also get turned to brown, but we'll see what happens. I like to experiment. And as I was telling you, I have some small skeins that I use for um, testing and that will give us an idea if we're heading in the right direction or what we need to add next. There's also a lot of actual recipes that you can mm -hmm. find online. So I'm gonna mix this with some warm water, get it in solution, and then we'll mix it into a big pot of water. I love having this beautiful outdoor sink that we salvaged from a neighbor um, that didn't want it. And we built the cabinet for it, and it's just been so wonderful to have a sink out here. Let me get the far view. a grayish blue. We can always adjust it. Pour that beautiful blue liquid in mm -hmm. there. And then you can grab a lighter. Okay. I love using these gas stoves for this. It's so much quicker than I used to use electric hot plates and are there induction? Induction, yeah. Have, have oh yeah, I know what those. you mean. Oh mm -hmm. look, there's a praying man that just flew oh. in to say hello to us. Hello, baby. Are you back? I know. Where is he? Right there. Um by the Oh big one. Leg. <laughs> okay. You get him in here. There he is. I get all the nature here when I'm <laughs> working. <laughs> have you seen walking sticks? Them, yes. <laughs> I've had a lot of praying mantis today. I mean, this year. They're I good had, for the garden. They are. They are great. And I had one that stayed for a really long time in this flower bed, and I called her Gus. I don't even know if it was her. It could have yeah. been him. I always like seeing them around. But did you see that video where one was grabbing hummingbirds? No. Oh, I couldn't believe it. I thought <laughs> I suddenly had not so f nice feelings about praying. It was on a. Um, oh it was on a hummingbird feeder, <laughs> and it was like hiding around the around the side of it. And the hummingbird came by, and it's actually reaching out to grab it and get it. Oh and I couldn't believe it. So well, I guess it was really hungry. Yeah. So we do know why it's called P R E Y I N G <laughs> praying mantis, and not P R A Y I N G <laughs> praying mantis. <laughs> not it, to be it, confused. It gets its prey. I thought because of the way its arms was, it was praying, you know. Right. <laughs> yeah. I learned better. So you had this going earlier. I did. It's yeah. still hot, but it's yeah. not It's not boiling. So as soon as I get this water warm, then this. I want to throw some meatballs in there. Right? <laughs> well, a lot of times I spend so much time dyeing yarn that the only thing there is for dinner is spaghetti because... <laughs> There's worse things for dinners. I didn't think it through. Our family loves spaghetti. Yeah. My husband especially. Yeah, Gary does too. Good thing. Right? Yeah. It's an easy one to get yep. on the table right. when you've been distracted all day by right. fun things. Right. Sometimes I get too involved with YouTube videos and I'll realize when he was working, he's retired now, but that uh, he was going to be home any minute and... <laughs> so I'd throw an onion and a pepper in the in the fry pan. He'd walk in. Oh, dinner smells good. Oh, you've been working hard. <laughs> That's a wonderful one. <laughs> Not quite ready yet, honey. But it sure does smell good. Sit down, relax a minute. <laughs> Get out that uh, canned sauce and throw it. In there. So how long does it have to be left? Just to get hot enough? And it has to be like close to simmering mm -hmm. um, for these 
particular concentrates. Mm -hmm. So like if you're using natural plant material, mm -hmm. um, each one is going to have its own little special point that gives it the best color. Most of the time if you stay below, right below boiling, most of your dye stuffs will work well. Now this is wool and you got it in hot, hot water. Mm -hmm. What happens with shrinkage? Okay, so wool isn't going to shrink unless you did, um, if I agitated and then dried this on high heat, that would cause the shrinkage. But we're not going to do that. Um, we're just testing the color right now. That's We were just making sure the color was what we wanted before we put the rest right, of these that's in. That's really pretty. And so we're going to go ahead and put these in. What you don't want to do is cause your wool to felt in the water. Right. And so you don't want to be stirring vigorously. Okay, okay. You don't want to dip it in and out really oh. strong. You can dip it in and out to get it to saturate. That's fine. But everything you do with wool should be kind of smooth and gentle gentle mm. and not, you know, don't yeah. be in there stirring your yarn. Right. Now, if I took this yarn and put it in the dryer and then yes. you know, tumbled it around in the dryer, right. that would definitely cause it to So stick. tell me when I make something with this, what is the care instructions? So the care instructions would be just as um, pretty much any other wool garment. You're going to want to uh, wash it in uh, cool, warm, cool or to warm water mm -hmm. with a gentle soap. Mm -hmm. um, you're not going to want to um, agitate it while it's in the bath. Mm -hmm. um, so you won't want to use your washing machine for 100% non-treated wool unless you can do it where it doesn't agitate. Um, so most people, I think, would just wash it in the bathtub, you know, wash it out in the bathtub with a gentle soap, mm -hmm. rinse it well in the shower, mm -hmm. kind of, and then um, hang it or lay it flat to dry. That's pretty. It's beautiful. So this was, um, and I think we're going to have a little bit of leftover dye even after dyeing this, is 60 grams of wool. And we did 10 grams of Saxon Blue Indigo from Botanical Colors. And then we did 9 grams of pomegranate extract from um, Botanical Colors. And that's the liquid natural dyes. So it's kind of a tealy blue. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. A lot of times with natural dyes, you will have um, exhaust color, which is the leftover color, and it still will yield another shade. So, you, you know, I could probably drop another skein in here and get a lighter version mm -hmm. of this same color. Mm -hmm. So they'll coordinate, but even though they're not the same. Mm -hmm. Cool. Hey, between the shot you saw us working inside and now... It's been a few weeks, and we actually went to Homesteaders of America, and we had a wonderful time. She's a working fool down there. <laughs> She's on staff, and she was flat out busy the whole time. Everyone is. It's a busy time for the team. Yes. Yeah, over 5,000 people, yeah. and Janet was in charge of vendors, of which mm -hmm. I was one, but there were 150... 156 vendors this year. That's a lot of vendors lot of for her to keep track of and take care of. It was packed. It was it packed. Was, but I think everybody enjoyed their time there. Yes. It was a wonderful time for everybody. So yeah. we were really happy to be there. Mm -hmm. um, and I made a poncho. I'll put you in certain photos here. With the wool you saw me buy from Janet in the last clip that was piled up on the chair and in the basket, I made a poncho and I made some mittens and they both sold. I'll put some pictures here. And since I came home, I made two more. I'm going to get up and show you. I made this hat with her yarn with braids in it. Isn't that pretty? And then these fingerless gloves, which match. So I made those as well. So that's all with her yarn. And now I'm just going to make, we're just going to do some crafting here and Janet's going to tell you what she's working at. Oh, yes, I did. I did want to share. These are so easy to make and, and so quick. And I don't know when this is going to air, but we still have most of, you know, half of October and November left of pumpkin season. And if you want a quick crochet craft, all you have to do is crochet a rectangle 
and you can use double or single crochet or you can mix it up however you want and then form it into a little tube and then you're going to just run a running stitch around the one end and flip it inside out and then fill it with some fiber fill. I've been filling mine with wool from our sheep because I have always wanted to do this where I make something from the wool that we have here, the dyes that I dyed, and then fill it with our sheep. It's just like a full circle little project that I've been working on. I've made a number of these little pumpkins. I sold some at uh, Homesteaders of America in my booth. And it's just kind of like a full circle thing of the sheep, you know, wool starts here and it ends, ends here in this little craft project. So that's a simple project for you to work up and uh, you can use them as little place settings or um, just little gifts or just decorate your own home with them. You can make them as big or as little as you want and I think it's just, I think it's super fun because I just like little mindless crafts that I can work on in the evening while the dogs are snuggling with me on the couch. Now Janet has an Etsy shop. I do have an Etsy shop. It's under Timber Creek Farm. And I have I'll my, put a link in this video. Yeah, too. I'll be listing things this week. Um, now that I'm back from Homesteaders of America, they always get my first uh, showings. And so I'll be listing more yarn. I'm working on more yarn right now as we speak. And um, we're here in my pavilion next to my dye building. So uh, we're, uh, I can keep things rolling and visit with my friend Susie at the same time. So it's wonderful. And if you live nearby, I'd love to have you over to also sit here and visit with me. Janet loves having people around that like to do the same things she likes I to do. do. It's, it's fun, fun to share my space mm -hmm. and what we've learned here as farmers on our property over the last 30 years. And so I'm really eager to share those kinds of tips <laughs> with people. And lucky me that uh, we discovered each other. Now she mentioned this on her Instagram, is that what they went yeah. on? But um, we actually live within like 20 minutes of each other and we didn't know each other, even though our kids went to the same <laughs> Christian school, we're crazy. And uh, we met at HOA and just kind of chatted and figured out, oh, we're, we're very close to each other. So we've since gotten together a few times. I made soap at her house and that was a video as well. That was fun. And now she's built this wonderful, I call it the yarn barn. <laughs> so the other thing I wanted to ask you about, Susie, is did you like your program this year from it the was, conference? It was beautiful. Had a lot of good information in it. I have to admit I used it mostly for scheduling and uh, seeing who was here and things like that. Yeah. If you still have it, I would, um, and if any of you still have your program, if you attended, um, there's a lot of articles in this uh, conference um, handout this year because coming up this uh, in 2023 Homesteaders of America is going to publish an actual paper magazine that you can uh, subscribe to and it will be filled with um, articles from a lot of your favorite homesteaders but in the in the conference schedule uh, we did have articles from Joel Salatin, Jill Winger, Amy Fuel, and myself um, where I uh, recounted the tales of our farm story in June when we had a tornado go through and pretty much level a lot of uh, our buildings. Um, the yarn uh, building had only been here for a couple of months when the tornado came through and it was spared almost completely. It had one little hole in the roof. Yeah. But the rest of our farm was pretty much crushed under a lot of the big trees that you've probably seen in this video. We are a heavily wooded tree farm that also is a uh, farm to fiber uh, creation farm. So we were pretty devastated, but soon we went from devastated to grateful very quickly because all of our animals' lives were spared. Surprisingly, even though their buildings, so even bad. though their buildings were crushed and their and their pens were crushed, as we cleared the debris, we found every single one of our chickens, goats, and sheep fine. Some of them were out back; they had escaped the barn and they were out back eating uh, down trees and limbs, just like nothing had really bothered mm -hmm. them. And the chickens had to wait a while for us to get to them, but when we did, they were fine. Even two little brooders, where a tree came down through the building with one brooder on one side and one brooder on the other side, and it was such a miracle.
love it when you come by to visit. And remember to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you'll know the next time I'm on with either a video or a live stream. And be sure to watch the videos popping up on your screen now because they'll show you some other things Bandana Grandma's been up to. God bless.